I'm Jane Nielsen. This week in the arena, Egypt has been an important ally of both the U.S. and Israel since the historic peace treaty brokered by President Jimmy Carter back in 1979. Now with its people's uprising that is aimed at toppling Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak's 30-year reign as leader of that powerful Middle Eastern nation, what will this mean to the stability of the region and what does it mean to the security of the U.S. and the tiny nation of Israel, who may now find itself surrounded by hostile enemies? We're going to talk about all of that. Joining us now is Monsignor Kieran Harrington, who is the Director of Communications for the Diocese of Brooklyn, Grant Galicho, the Associate Editor of Commonwealth Magazine, and our special guest today in studio, Dr. Rose Tabrizi, who is the Associate Professor of Economics at St. Francis College right here in Brooklyn. Also, via Skype today, we have with us Dr. Azadine Leachi, who is a professor of International and Middle East Affairs at St. John's University. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much. Let's start with you, Dr. Tabrizi. Yes. This seemed to us here in America, in our very parochial vision, as an uprising that kind of came up overnight. But the reality is it had been building itself up for a very yes. long time. Yes, that's true. And I think that is because of the bad economy that this country has gone through for generations, actually. The economy, the, when you're talking about you're talking about a very high unemployment rate, young am, people. Young people and about 70 to 75 percent of young people that is below 30 years old, they are unemployed. What's the average uh, household income of an Egyptian oh, family? Well, per capita income, this is what you mean, per, per capita income is only 6,000 per year. Six thousand dollars, the equivalent 6, of six thousand dollars per, dollars per year, and that is PPP. That is yeah. purchasing power parity. It yeah. means that with six thousand dollars, what we can buy here, yeah. right? People live there, right. and they're also dealing year. with, like, and they're dealing with hyperinflation, basically. And rate of inflation actually is going up. I mean, two thousand nine, it was I think eleven point nine percent. Two thousand ten is 12.8 percent rather than wow. going down is actually going yeah. up and it makes it much worse. Let's go to Dr. Uh, Laeshi who is via Skype and, and give me your perspective on again this kind of view that we have that this thing happens so quickly. What is underlying all of this too? A rise in the cost of, uh, of food and going back to 2008. Sure. Now, but do, do you think that the, do you think that the fact that there was upheaval in Tunisia uh, uh, that this is now happening in Egypt is this a regional event that's happening is this is this akin to the Eastern Europe the fall of the Berlin Wall where we're going to see in this region uh, a uh, upheaval against authoritarian regimes is, is that what we're seeing here if uh, or is or is there something different occurring? No, there is a, a, there were some similarities, but we cannot push the similarities too much, too far, because what, what, what happened in Eastern Europe, of course, we know that there was one overarching power that uh, had uh, a, 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 an extensive control over a, a series of countries. And then once that, 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 uh, that power collapsed, I, I'm meaning the USSR, and even before it collapsed, there was some commotion in places like, uh, like Poland. Uh, then once that system collapsed, then there was, of course, uh, uh, almost a rush into overthrowing the existing orders, those that have existed since the end of World War II. Uh, and, uh, and there was a tremendous, of course, support from the West uh, for that change. Uh, it was uh, an, an important event, and it was, uh, in a sense, a revolution that was continental-wide. Now, in the, in the context of what is happening in the Middle East and North Africa, we have a popular upheaval against authoritarian systems that have been in power, and fortunately with a collusion of external forces that have helped maintain them in power. Now, the movement for change is perceived as something positive that needs to be supported, but at the same time there is some reluctance on the part of the Western powers to really push those who are in power out and especially doctor, suddenly because of the ramifications, especially... Doc, doctor, the, the, the collusion with the power, though, that seems to keep these authoritarian regimes in power, uh, the, the finger comes to be pointed at the United States. So in, in some case, uh, what people would argue is, is that it's the United States that's propping up authoritarian regimes. No, it did not, it did not prop them up. But the support that these regimes have obtained in the sense of having normal kind of relations with them. 
not questioning the treatment of human rights by these, by these, uh, by these regimes, not, not really pushing for a positive change that would benefit society at large. This, these kinds of either uh, active policies or uh, tacit uh, policies have, in a sense, played in the hands of the authoritarian rule. Uh, and so uh, whenever there was a popular upheaval, no one really ran to sustain it or to help it or to promote it. And we could see, for example, the current policy of this administration today. Now, at one point, uh, Obama was saying Egypt needs change now. We cannot wait until September. But then as many powers, you know, and many, many regimes and many, many leaders even in the region and also in Europe were concerned about the, uh, the conse possible consequences of a sudden fall of the Egyptian regime in terms of security, in terms of interest, and so on. Now this administration is saying, okay, we really want change, we support the democratic movement, but this change has to be gradual, has to be slowly, let's wait until September. So it is no longer going with the street, but it is going with exactly what Mubarak has said. Yes, I will leave, but in September and in my own terms. Now, people are afraid that if this route is taken, that there will be no change. Absolutely. You, you, that just that just signals what's going to happen next. You know, Dr. Tabrizi, you yes. were actually in Iran yes. and in the middle of the uprising yes. uh, back in 1979. I mean, do you see a lot of similarities here? Yes. Uh, well, repression that we see it is similar. The way that the police attacks and white clothed people that they come and they attack the people. And as in Iran, they were fed up with the dictatorship of the Shah. And because the Shah was kind of, I mean, Iranian version of Mubarak. Right. But is that, that's the big question, right? Is, is yeah. that, was it, was in Iran, was it the, the revolution in 1979 essentially a moderate revolution that became a ultra-right or religious uh, revolution? Did that morph? And is, is, because a lot of people are drawing the parallel to say that what happened in Tehran in 1979 is, it's possible that that could happen in Egypt and in other parts of the Middle East where basically you have a radicalization of relatively moderate countries? Well, uh, the present regime, which is the outcome of 1979, yeah. uh, they are trying to say that what is happening, actually they said it in the last, uh, I mean, the Supreme Leader said it, that what is happening in Egypt is the result of our uh, revolution in 1979. Mm -hmm. but uh, it is not. Yeah, it's not. It's okay, but here's not. Effect. Yeah, <laughs> it is not. It is. Uh, it is yeah. not. Here's my question to you, though, Doctor La Leashi. Looking at this from um, your perspective, uh, studying international mm -hmm. affairs, we see this radical radicalization that took place in Iran. But I think in Egypt, isn't it fair to say it might be different because we've got so much more communication because Egypt has so much more. Uh, communication with the outside world, there's so much Western influence, there's tourism is such a big part of the economy. I agree with you uh, uh, with the idea that the situation is, is different. We thank you so much for your thoughts with, uh, with us today, uh, Dr. Layashi. We, uh, we truly appreciate it, and we are going to continue this discussion right here in just a moment. We're going to take a break. We'll be back with more of In the Arena shortly. <music> back as we continue our discussion on the crisis in Egypt. Joining us once again uh, for this segment is Dr. Baruz Tabrizi, the Associate Professor of Economics at St. Francis College. And also joining us now is Ed Clancy, who is the Director of Outreach and Evangelization Aid to the Church in Need USA. Um, and of course, Monsignor Kieran Harrington is here. I guess one of the things that, that we just heard um, from Professor Leachi is uh, talking about who's in charge now and who's actually going to, to, to take over in this democratic process. Um, but what does that mean for all of the religious aspects of what's going on in Egypt? That is the main problem. If, because this movement is not really uh, organized, and that is a problem. 
if they were organized, I mean, within these 15 days, so they could have done much more. But because it is not organized, and that uh, mixed idea, you know, leave it in the air that what should be done and who is going to take the power. That is the main thing. And then what about the concerns about, from a religious aspect, does this become a far more fundamental country? I, I mean, Ed, you are mm -hmm. associated with people over th in Egypt who, yes. um, with, the, with the Christian population or the Coptic Christians. Yes. And they've, they're fearful about what's happening. They are very much. I mean, there's, there's always hope. I mean, that's, that's the Christian attitude to have hope. But um, also there's a great fear because they, they have seen what has happened in other countries, as you were discussing before, like Iran or... Well, or what, countries like Iraq, where you know there's persecution going on directly of Christians. Well, what our audience may not recognize is that in Egypt, people are required to carry an identity card mm -hmm. that that states on it what their religious uh, sect is. That's correct. Every 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 person carries a, a national identity card, and on it it has the uh, your religion, your faith, and the reasoning for this was put into government because. Each group is to, is to be judged by their religious laws. So Christians are supposed to be judged by their Christian laws and the Muslims by their Muslim laws. Whoa, that is really confusing. The Christians make up about 10% of the Egyptian population, right? And the mm -hmm. largest uh, portion of that is uh, Coptic Orthodox. Correct. What impact do you think? I mean, Mubarak has been seen as, uh, has seen as sympathetic to to. Ca to Coptic Christians, at least uh, there hasn't been overt persecution mm -hmm. of Coptic uh, Christians. I mean, do you think that as a result of what's happening now, you could see a fleeing of Coptic Christians from Egypt, as Christians have been fleeing from Lebanon and other places uh, in the Middle East? I, I, I would say that, I mean, they're, they're an apostolic church in that they were founded by St. Mark, the evangelist. Right. So they're there from the very beginning, and they have very strong roots within Egypt. And even though they're only 10% of the population, they are strongly there. They haven't gone away. And I think there's a sense of, um, you know, we're going to stay here. This is our country. So that sort of um, uh, nationalism or sort of strength of faith will probably keep them there up to the points where we would probably walk away. But if it does go like what happened in Iran, if it does go like, what, like it has happened in other countries, they will flee. I mean, the Holy Land is losing its Christian population. I used to live in Jerusalem. And in 1995, when I would go visit Bethlehem, the population there was somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 percent Christian. Twenty years before, it was 40 percent Christian. Now it is about 5 percent Christian, maybe less. And this is because the Christian families do not see any opportunity for their children. So as soon as they get educated, they leave. In, in the midst of lawlessness, <coughs> which is basically what is happening now, basic breakdown in government, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Mubarak uh, regime has been put back on its heels. Uh, the question, I guess, would come is, is if you're a minority, uh, and in some sense a persecuted minority, I mean, how frightening is it to come out of your house? Because you're afraid that the, what, the person who was your neighbor yesterday has been radicalized, and now they are my enemy today. I mean, we've seen that. In, that's not in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. That was, that, that was exactly the reverse for the Muslim population, where a person was Muslim, and they were living side by side Christians, and all of a sudden the Christians were slaughtering the Muslims, and the water, Muslims were slaughtering Christians. I do think this happens in Egypt. Okay. That is my personal feeling. I, I don't think that this will happen in Egypt. How much of it has to do also with the role that the social media and instant communication played in this revolt that happened? Isn't it true that when you've got that, that helps people become really informed and maybe help prevent some of the radicalization? That is, I think, one of the main reasons comparing to 1979 in Iran and now, the thing is that now People are much more open-minded. They have access to internet. And for that reason, uh, they know that what is happening in Iran, they know that what's happening in other places, and how dangerous it is that if they go by radicals, religious radicals. But, but I mean, this, is, this, is, this story has played itself out historically, right? I mean, we, we talked about the economic influences, that you basically have high, uh, high unemployment, you have high inflation. We've talked about some of the political implications of authoritarian regime. Yeah. I mean, this is simply what was happened, the Weimar Republic, you know, after, uh, after the First World War. I mean, there are some 
implications. And, and though the Muslim Brotherhood may only have the support of 25% of the population, a lot of uh, statisticians seem to, uh, seem to think that their opinions, their views, their worldview is shared by far more Egyptians than the 25% of the people who belong to the Muslim Brotherhood. So for instance, opinions about Israel and the relationship of Israel vis-a-vis -vis Egypt mm -hmm. is a, a major concern, or the place of Egypt vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors uh, uh, in the Middle East or vis-a-vis -vis the United States. So while there may be a small number of adherents to the Muslim Brotherhood, are those views basically shared by a, a large number of Egyptians who are basically disaffected economically and politically? And yes, and I think here there are two things we have to distinguish. One is the foreign policy. I 100% agree with you that Islamic views plays a very, very extremely important role in regard with Israel. Yeah. No doubt about it. I have no doubt about yeah. it. But as far as the internal policy is concerned, I don't think that Egyptians, they like to have a religious state like the one that we have it in Iran. I don't think so. And I think that's they want democracy. Theory, they want democracy. The fear is that if this 25% builds a foundation of support within e the, the current government or the future government, that it will in fact cause this radicalization and that the Christian communities will be persecuted. And then I think one of the concerns that we have looking at it from here many thousands of miles away is thinking about the polarization that may occur. And as we all know, we have since 9-11, and I'm bringing it back to that place, mm -hmm. the concerns and the fear about Islam. Mm -hmm. Will this only heighten it if we see Egypt becoming far more radical? I think it would only help to do that. I think it's really a, a, a difficult situation in that Egypt is under economic stress, it's under political stress from the outside, and there's no doubt that the, the radicalization would cause maybe a cascading effect within the region. So does, I mean, here's, a, I guess, the question, the million dollar question. At the end of the day, do we see Egypt more like Turkey or do we see Egypt more like Iran? No, definitely Turkey. Turkey? Turkey. 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 Yeah. Be more tolerant, more open. Yes. That's our hope, our aspiration. This is our hope. But that, yeah. do we think that that will be the outcome? They play some politics, this uh, mm -hmm. uh, Muslim Brotherhood, because in Iran, the leader of Iran, last Friday, in praying, you know, Friday yeah. praying, he said that, well, what happens in Egypt is the result of our revolution and they are following our path. Immediately, after, say, maybe one hour, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, they replied. They said that, no, we are not going to become like Iran. We are not following the Khomeini's path. Clearly, they said it. But maybe it is politics to begin with. <laughs> yeah, but that was probably very encouraging to you and to the world, correct? For the time being, yes, for the for time, time being. being. But I don't think that we should be fooled. We have to watch them very carefully, and I think when the, we have the government, they are going to form a government, uh, it should be polarized. It shouldn't be just does, one does single Does it matter party. that they're Sunni or Shia? Uh, to begin with, it doesn't, because to begin with, they are all Muslims. But down the road, definitely. Down the road. Okay, Definitely. so we're getting the point down the road. Watch, wait, see, see what happens. Exactly. Don't make judgments right now. Ed, we thank you very much. You. Dr. DeBreezy, we thank you so much for thank being you. with us. Thank and we are going to take a break. We want to remind you that you can weigh in on our discussion anytime by going to our website at netny.net slash in the arena and click on enter the arena. We always welcome your questions and your comments. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Continuing our conversation now about the crisis in Egypt, we are joined once again by Monsignor Kieran Harrington, the Director of Communications for the Diocese of Brooklyn, and our regular contributors, Elizabeth Scalia, Managing Editor of the Catholic Portal at Patheos.com, and author of the blog, The Anchoress, and then Grant Galicho, the Associate Editor of Commonwealth Magazine. One of the things that we did not say earlier when we were talking about the Coptic Christians is that they actually have been engaged in this revolution in yeah. Egypt. Uh, fairly recently I read a report about um, a, a march that was taking place with Muslims and Christians walking together, the, mu the Muslim holding up the Quran, Christian holding up a cross. 
and, and I've, I've also read that there have been public masses held. Right. So, I mean, so the thing is, is that while they are fearful about uh, perhaps a radicalization of, of the Islamic religion in Egypt, at the same time, they are still out there working for change. Right. Well, they also are having trouble buying food. Sure, uh, of making course. ends meet, you know. One of the most moving photographs I've seen, and I've, I've been loving the pictures coming out of Cairo, um, but this fascinating one was Muslims at prayer in the streets of Cairo with Christians surrounding them, holding hands and blocking them, guarding them so that they could get their prayers in without being assaulted by anyone. And this is a reflection. It goes back to, I think, the Muslims who guarded Christians, the Coptic Christians at Christmas time, surrounding their church and, and, and protecting them with their own bodies so that they weren't, would not be bothered while they were worshiping at Christmas. This is a great mustard seed, um, <laughs> a place for, for growth to really happen that's completely outside of governments and policies. And we hope that is what truly happens. I know a young woman studying in Egypt who is from Long Island, a Catholic uh, girl whose uncle was one of the captains in the fire department who was killed in 9-11 and the reason she was in Egypt studying was because she is so interested in fostering the you know ways of Muslims and Catholics and Christians coming together it's a beautiful beautiful kind of silver lining that came out of 9-11 and of course she was skirted out of there and, and went went to Turkey um, for her own safety and the safety of the other students but she wants to go back, and she said as they were leaving, they were consistently stopped by Egyptians who said, we're so sorry that you're caught in the middle of this. We're fighting for change. This has nothing to do with you, and we hope that you'll come back and that you will love us. So, again, what you're talking about is that little foster of seed, which is, I hope, ultimately what we can all take away from and this. And the Jews are not excluded from this either. There are a lot of Orthodox Jews, and, and I was reading a piece in uh, the Jerusalem Post uh, about Jews who were praying for Egypt and for the best possible outcome. Obviously, they have Israel on their minds, but they were also praying for the good of the Egyptian people, uh, for their empowerment and for uh, a less oppressive government. But realistically, how... How are we supposed to think when we do see those images that are also quite terrorizing, when we see American journalists that have been ganged up upon, when we see all of that, it becomes scary. I just am skeptical uh, of the outcome. I think when you have authoritarian regimes that fall, a lot of bad things happen. We see that happening in Russia and other places in Eastern Europe. Uh, to me, I don't think, while well, Elizabeth makes that point about Christians uh, circling Muslims who are praying and Muslims protecting Christians who are, pr who are in church, the fact is, is the reason why Christians had to be protected by Muslims when they were at church on, on Christmas was not because of the Hosni Mubarak government. It was because of the people who live in Egypt. There's a reason why Americans and other Europeans were being evacuated in the midst of these demonstrations. Bad things can happen, and I fear that a bad things will happen uh, in, in the future. And so I think it's right we all pray because uh, this is a very, very scary time for Egypt and the Middle East. It's a very volatile situation. Grant, last thought? Uh, I hope the U.S. military uses its, or the uh, U.S. government uses its military aid stick to help to control violence against protesters in Egypt. And that is all for us today. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Monsignor. We really appreciate it. Thank you for being with us. And remember that you don't need a TV to watch the net. We are always on, online, at netny.net. For all of us here, I'm Jane Hansen. We'll see you next time in the arena.